Perfect. Thank you for waiting. Welcome to this online event from Pearson. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you'll know how to participate in today's event. Before we discuss how to download any associated materials and use the platform, I would like to inform you that this session will be recorded for regulatory purposes and for our quality assurance. You can download the delegate materials for this session by clicking the resources button located at the lower right part of the Zoom menu option. You can interact with the presenter and other attendees anytime by typing your questions into the chat box, which is located at the bottom right side of your screen. Please note that anything you type into this window can immediately be seen by other delegates in the room. To enter a question or comment, type into the bottom section of the chat window and hit enter on your keyboard. You may also use the same chat box for assistance in case you encounter any technical issues during the event. At this time, everyone is joined on mute, but you will have the control to unmute themselves, so please stay on mute if you don't need to speak. To keep the questions, click on raise hand at the menu bar at the bottom. If you don't see this, click on the icon labelled participants and select raise hand, otherwise try holding alt and the letter Y on your keyboard. That's all I need to go through for now. I'm not now going to pass it back over to Quentin. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone, Quentin Brewer here, and we're doing the last of these nine sessions. I would just like to say at the start of this, um, I don't know whether Pearson might want to do any more in the future. Um, if so, uh, perhaps at some point uh, or at the very end, you could just put in the chat box a particular areas that you'd like them to cover. Okay, so today we're looking at some further items on unit, sorry, theme four, and we'll go through those and also finishing up with some exam techniques. And the, I'm sorry. So on the aims and objectives, I particularly wanted to point out to you that some of the quantitative skills, we mentioned some of those things as we go through. Um, one or two particular points relating to development economics to help you and also um, as I put at the bottom there, to increase, to help you increase your students' confidence in preparing for the exams. So, first of all, we're looking at poverty and inequality. And this first issue is quite an issue. And it is really, it's another illustration of why the spec needs to be updated. This doesn't just apply to us, of course, it applies to everyone, or all, all people doing economics for any, any assessment board. Um, but extreme poverty used to re always be referred to as absolute poverty. And this is very much a sort of positive thing. It's lack of one or more basic needs over a period of time. And you can see from that measurement there, you will get a clear result of what is meant by absolute poverty. However, there is... Um, some vagueness now about absolute poverty because the UK government measures it and along with others I have to say how people this year cannot afford a set standard of living now I won't go through all of that definition but if you're interested you can read that and what is quite clear is that until the spec is rewritten either definition of absolute poverty will be credited. I would stick with the one that's now called extreme poverty to mean absolute poverty and just go with that for the time being. Tell your students it's now called extreme poverty. But of course in the spec it's still referred to as absolute poverty. Now relative poverty is a much more subjective definition um, and of it because it refers to people living in households with income below 60% of the median income. Straight away here, we've got a quantitative skill. What do you mean by median income? Or the median, it's the point at which half households have lower income and half have a higher income. So that's the definition of relative poverty. Obviously, it's going to be different for different countries with different income levels. So it's, it's, it's not like absolute poverty. But it does measure, attempt to measure this form of social inclusion, um, whose costs in terms of consumption increases with living standards. So if you're, you, you've got a relative poverty line, as they will be different for different countries. Those of you who are really interested in this can go to the World Bank, and there's an academic discussion about this debate from, 19, from 2022, I think it is, um, about absolute versus relative poverty. 
This next slide simply summarizes um, some of the causes of changes in absolute or rel relative poverty. And I think I'll just pick out, you know, if you're thinking about a developed country here, you may well want to look at things like welfare payments, changes in taxation, and the changes in access to public services and their quality as being particular of particular interest. If you're looking at a developing country, obviously there's all kinds of other thing, things that uh, have an impact as well. But, you know, just giving you a couple of ideas. When we come to inequality, again, precision is everything, as I've tried to reiterate in all these in all these sessions. And it's really important that your students understand this idea that wealth is a stock of assets. It's, you know, your house, it's things, things like that, whereas income is a flow, a flow concept, and it often refers to the flow of income you get over a period of time. How do we measure inequality? Well, we use Lorenz curves. That is illustrated in the next slide, which we'll come back to in a second. And um, then the actual measurement is by the Gini coefficient, as we'll see, it's measured by this uh, representation of area A over area A plus B. And that gives you a value. Usually it's described as between zero and one. However, you will see in some official data, they use it as a percentage, so multiply that by 100. So when you're looking at this Lorenz curve diagram, the 45 degree line is the line of perfect equality. Down here, um, if, you, if you were at the, on the horizontal axis, you'd, you'll be at perfect inequality. So the closer the line, the curve is to the 45 degree line, the more equal the distribution is, the uh, income distribution is, and vice versa. Again, encourage your students to be critical about this. Is this disposable income we're looking at? Is it gross income? You know, there's a lot of issues around what it's really measuring. Sometimes it's not clear from the data, and that will be a very good evaluative point to give if students just given something like this, cumulative percentage of income. And, you know, one of the things they can, they can uh, discuss is, well, is it disposable or is it gross? Well, what about causes of income inequality? And there's a whole range of things. I've put a question mark next to globalisation because, as I mentioned last week, a recent Economist article uh, was uh, based on research was suggesting that maybe this whole idea that globalisation causes more inequality within countries is perhaps a mis is perhaps a mistake. And it depends on all kinds of issues of how it was measured, et cetera, et cetera. It's open to debate, put it that way. And obviously, if you're looking at developing countries, you may well look at impacts of things like history and the impact of colonialism, uh, geography, and so on. Um, I think the degree of inherited wealth is something well worth exploring with your students, because obviously that has quite a big impact in terms of income inequality. And again, we picked up there about health and education and so on. But again, it's a useful summary, really, to think about and get your students to discuss. There are other things in the spec that I thought I'd just give you a couple of sources for. So one item that occurs in the spec, not necessarily easy to, to teach, is impact of economic change and development on inequality. Now, an interesting report from a couple of years ago by the IFS, got, you've got the link there. The Kuznets curve, which you could use in, in uh, explaining this, is not on the spec, but obviously it will be credited if used in a, relative, in, in a relevant way. And for a global perspective on economic change and income inequality, there's, a, a, again, a useful link there to, to the World Economic Forum. Something for you to think of now, uh, you don't have to write the answers in check textbooks, but I wonder if you get this right. In 1980, roughly 40% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty with less than $2 a day. What is that proportion today? 10, 30, 50. Answer, 10%. Right, okay, Just try that on your students, see if they, they get that right. And then another line in the spec is capitalism in inequality. And I just put a link here because, again, what you should be doing all the way through this is try to link up with what you've done before. 
to re remember this whole thing I started off with, try and see the links between different parts of the spec. And this was, obviously now this is a right-wing organization, so you know where they're coming from essentially. Um, but the, it is quite an interesting video about Poland and how it transformed itself from a really a command economy to more free market economy. And obviously it's led to increase inequality. What the IEA, of course, is interested in uh, stating is how it's increased prosperity. But a good thing to look at with your students, perhaps at the very start of the course, but come back to it now as revision. A little thing on the activity here. I've just put um, consider question four. This is th this is just to give you an example of short answer questions, really. And what you can see here is um, Gini coefficient for UK twenty seven to uh, seven to twenty thirteen. This is from an old paper, as you can see. Um, one likely reason for the change in income inequality. I put in the mask. This is all in your delegate booklet, so there's no need to, uh, you know, you can look at that if you want to. I've put it on screen here, though. And I've said, what mark will be awarded? Just think about this for one minute, literally only one minute. Well, this was, you, you might like to know, is, uh, was awarded full marks, four marks, um, because he starts off by saying, well, one thing might be due to the implementation of minimum wage, uh, have national minimum wage, people are able to have higher relative incomes. Then you've got this idea, they've data reference and so on. So it was awarded the full four marks. The key thing in these questions is there are only four marks, don't tell them to write, you know, encourage them to write as little as possible, but answer the question. And really, really important, use the data as this candidate has done. And so that's that's the path forward on these questions. If you read the examiner's reports and, uh, you know, you, you see all these things from Mark Skins and so on, what you find the, in the exam reports, all the principal examiners always going on about people spend far too much time right answering these short answer questions. Then they come to the essay and they don't have enough time to write a proper answer. So really impress on the students. They don't necessarily need to write much, but they've got to hit the relevant things and not least use in the context. Right. Now, again, growth versus development. We have here economic growth quite clearly. In, this is in the field of positive economics because it's measured by something that you can see. However, economic development is far more subjective, far more normative. Because, for example, look at that board I put in brackets there. There's a number of economists who would say, well, for economic development to truly be taking place, it's got to be more political and civil liberty. Well, that is how do you measure that? I mean, it's really difficult and even increased provision of basic amenities. Well, what do you really mean by that? It's much more subjective. The measure in your uh, spec that, that really tries to capture development is the HDR. There are other measures, but you'll see that this captures three things, life expectancy, expected years of schooling, and gross national income per capita. Notice also, this is a quantitative skill, so it is something that's expected. They, your students should be able to interpret um, the, the numbers in the Human Development Index, what they mean, comparisons with other countries, etc. Well, that brings us on to some of the limits of growth and development. And what you can see here is we've got a whole range of factors. I'm not going to go through them all. I'm going to mention particularly savings gap in a moment. But things that are affecting countries at the moment are debt, because obviously with higher interest rates, the burden of debt has increased for many developing countries. Some are in quite critical conditions, combined with the increased value of the dollar, the strength of the dollar. And many of these debts are denominated in dollars, so this crisis creates an increased burden on these developing countries. 
these things need to be unpacked, all these different things. And I will say something about primary product dependency in, in, in a bit as well. But I think for all these things, I'll talk about how to teach all this a bit later on. So taking one of those issues, the problem of low savings, something again your students need to know about is the Haridoma model. So you've got low savings. If there's low savings, there's probably low investment. There's low capital accum accumulation. Therefore, economic growth is low, low incomes and output, etc. And so um, the question then is, how might this problem be alleviated without an increase in savings? And the key thing here is, you, you know, you will know the answers, but for your students, can they think of anything? Well, of course, it comes in often in the form of aid, debt relief, relief or perhaps the, uh, an increase in foreign direct investment may be promoted by the government in some way. And this shows how it will work if you get this increase in savings or indeed any of those other sources. You then get this increase in net investment, higher capital stock, more GDP, increased factor incomes, etc. And so the whole thing enables um, countries to grow and develop. Now, to again get your students, again, this is going back to theme two, really good you know, reinforcement exercise. If you're doing some revision now, this is where you can get them into it. Can they divide these into market-orientated and interventionist strategies? Remember, and we've had this, and this has come up before, you need to be aware of this. Your students might get a question that says, uh, discuss market-orientated strategies that could help X country, whatever it is, to um, grow and develop. And... Can they remember what they are? Well, this is a little exercise. They will have come across some of these in theme two. So you hope, therefore, they will remember those and be able to work out which of these others are market orientated or interventionist. So something for students to do, there's an answer there for you as well. So I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but helpful to, to, to do that little exercise. Now, remember, apart from those, there are other things that can promote um, growth and development. And sorry, that slide has been, yeah, anyway, development of tourism, that should say. Uh, very interesting today when we talk about tourism as a means of development. I hope you all read about Venice introducing, was it a five euro per person um, visitor uh, to Venice? And so... It, the great thing about this topic is it's so wonderful for not only doing analysis, but also evaluation. So to what extent is, you know, tourism a problem? It's main, it may help development, but it might be a problem. So I'm not talking about Italy now. I'm talking about, well, think about Canary Islands. Uh, well, they're hardly developing, but, you know, you've got the same issue there. There have been protests against tourists. Now, similarly, if you go to, if you go to more developing countries, well they are facing similar issues about, you know, the, the issue of water. Um, does the water mainly go to um, people who are tourists rather than to local people? And so there's all kinds of other ways in which growth and development might be promoted and well worth looking at, at those. You obviously, you need to do that with the students. Now, thinking about some of these methods again one of the things and i've come back to this theme again because i'm very keen you know your students must be critical thinking thinkers learners is not enough for your economic students they've got to be critical thinkers keep hammering that home to them and take i've taken this example of microfinance and people you know sometimes have taught this in a very through rose-colored spectacles and then you actually look at a lot of research on this and you begin to wonder. And I've just put on this next slide a number of things here where people have been unhappy and said, well, if uh, Ha Yun Chang and Mil Milford Bateman have sort of suggested that it's based on the attractive but false premise that poor people can make themselves richer by providing they have access to credit. Now, they argue that you need some state intervention, collective endeavour. 
They also say that it's self-financing, but in reality, a lot of the interest rates charged on loans are very, very high. Um, most loans are not used to create small business at all. They are used for consumption smoothing. So, you know, is it really setting up small businesses? Do they create prosperous businesses in the long run? There's a debate about that. And some people actually argue, and these economists certainly do, that it could inhibit poverty reduction because it's diverging attention for, and resources from the much more important state coordinated policy interventions institutions and so on um, that have been crucial in countries such as Vietnam, China, South Korea. So their argument is this has all been grossly overplayed and we perhaps should think much more critically about its value. Now this brings me to this strategy if you haven't used this or you might be using this next year is to really get your students to do some research themselves. And they can do presentations to the rest of the class or produce information for the rest of the class. And I've suggested here, you know, they take countries from South America, from Africa, from Asia, get them to look at some key areas like constraints, like the factors that might have contributed growth and development, what challenges they're likely to face in the future, or they may, may be facing now. I mean, one might be political instability, for example. And this will help, you know, sometimes the, the questions will say, in, say, paper two, you know, uh, refer to a developing country of your choice in your answer. And if they can then think about if it's a if it's a, a question about aid a, a country they've studied that or they one of their fellow students studied that has had a lot of aid and the extent to which it's been successful and obviously this link has huge links with all other parts of the spec with many other parts of the spec i should say i mean if you just take one thing there monopsony scene three we did this not so long ago well there's a problem in the sense that if you're a developing country producing a primary product, then you might face um, huge mono monopsonists or firms with a monopsonist power that drive down the price you can get for your raw material. And one of the key things in some of the sort of rice or something where, where the before the product has been processed, it's taken out of the country. And the producers of that primary product actually get a tiny amount of the total amount of value of the product once it's been processed, usually, or maybe in a developed country. And then again, I'll just, I'll just stop for a second and just think for a moment, primary product dependency, what links are there with other parts of the spec? Again, have a quick think about that. Right, well, you had a quick think. I haven't even asked you to put anything in the chat box because I just wanted you to think. But think about specialisation, comparative advantage, income elasticity of demand. And that brings into this idea of the Prebesh-Singer hypothesis, this idea that, you know, income elasticity of demand for primary products is often relatively low. Therefore, incomes of producers in those countries producing primary products will fall relative to producers of manufactured goods. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that because, as well, we'll see in a moment uh, a couple of exceptions, but there are exceptions to that. And other things that you might think of in, in relation to primary product dependency is a number of countries will use buffer stock schemes, which, again, brings into this idea of minimum prices, which they've studied before balance of trade, exchange rate, monopsy, etc. So there are plenty of links again with other bits of the spec. Now the financial sector, again, if you're new to the spec and uh, new to teaching economics, um, you might have studied quite a lot of this at university. What you have to understand in this spec is that the real emphasis on, is on the significance to the whole economy. It is not um, 
in a sense, it's not, you've not got to massive detail. And I've really put this second point, it's regulation light. What I mean by that is there is not a vast amount of knowledge that you have, your students need to have to cope with this section. It is incredibly technical. Um, I remember when the spec was being built and uh, was being written and I sat in a room and saying, well, I can't imagine anything worse than teaching financial regulation on a wet Friday afternoon in November um, because I was subject to that and I had to teach some of that way back and it was just tedious. And then it all changes anyway. So I, I really, you know, focus on the, the significance to the whole economy. And you can use this to revise other parts of the spec. And I've given some examples in the, these slides. So, for example, role of financial markets to facilitate savings. This is in the spec. Well, yeah, that links to how the money is stored value might be undermined by inflation. Um, to lend businesses brings you into this whole idea of consumer debt, business debt, government debt. Facilitate exchange of goods and services brings you into the idea of specialisation, comparative advantage, trade, forward markets, and then market for equities. Now, market failure. You, we all went through market failure. You're probably taught market failure to, to your year 12s. And now you've got some other aspects of market failure that weren't there. Yes, they had asymmetric information. I've related here a couple of examples to the financial sector. But now we have also moral hazard so remember, this is this idea that a firm, in this case a bank, will have an incentive to take a risk thinking, well, it won't bear the full cost of that risk. And there are real concerns. Yesterday was an article about uh, private equity. Uh, bank of England, I think, was worried about private equity getting into difficulties because they've taken on a hell of a load of debt. Um, and I, there's also... A case only in the sort of inside pages of financial uh, journals at the moment but about uh, particularly in America they're very concerned about banks having a lot of debt um, outstanding on offices because what you find now is so much working from home value of many offices not the premium ones but in other parts of the country are falling and these banks have got some what may turn out to be bad loans from developers who've built these things and are not now going to be able to rent them out, probably be knocked down. So this is quite, this is an issue for 2026, I reckon. Um, and then speculation market bubbles. I've given a, a, another link there to market rigging because that's again a complex area, but it's quite useful. You know, it's a term in the spec. They need to know something about it. You could get some students to look at that video and explain to the rest of the class what it actually means. Then theme three links. So this is why I'm saying if you're teaching this stuff, you could do a lot of material from previous uh, themes. So in this case, we have had uh, banks being virtually nationalised, but mostly in private sector, what are their objectives? Then market structures, to what extent is it olig oligopolistic? Think again, again, one thing I'll keep emphasising to you is this is a real subject. The emphasis on the spec is not to teach it as purely theoretical, but to teach, it, to teach um, how economic applies to the real world. And what have we got? Uh, Coventry Building Society taking over the co-op. Um, and then we've also had Nationwide taking over Virgin Money. So, however, remember there have been new banks like Metro Banks in the last decade or so coming into the market. Um, so you can really, you could, you could go through a lot of theme three by, te by teaching the financial sector. And then, of course, the regulation. And then another area is the role of central banks. How does this sync to everything else you've taught them? Well, it obviously links to monetary policy, what you did in theme two, uh, ADAS, et cetera. Banks to the government. And um, this is something, if that, you haven't taught it, it'd be dealing with national debt. Bank to the government. And again, think about acting as lender of last resort, financial crisis 2008, and this links very well to external shocks that can 
cause the bank to have to use this function. And then the role of regulation. And I would just do, sorry, a fairly brief thing here on the PRA and the FCA. Please do not spend hours teaching this. I really don't think that's a good use of time. Um, then activity again, just to think a bit about this again, this is a four mark question. And just look at the question for a moment. It says in 2020, the UK government introduced low scheme to help small businesses survive the downturn in the economy. Small businesses could borrow up to 50K interest rate 2.5 percent if only that was true now uh, for up to six years government guaranteed 100 percent of the loans to enable banks to use them quickly and only minimal checks were made on borrowers so what role could you talk about for four marks given that information so you can see here again the mark scheme they got two for knowledge about lending application where well, they want the, they really just want you to use the data in in the in the in, in the question and then a bit of analysis so loans provide finance for suffering drop in demand or whatever it is and then here is an answer notice the brevity of it very short one role could be to lead to businesses and individual to lend to businesses the information stated small businesses could borrow up to 50k got some application government introduced a scheme to boost consumption and investment that's another knowledge mark in the in the analysis and then that would help economic growth, a bit of analysis. All four marks there in just a few lines. Right, let's think then about public finance. Obviously, the guy, the thing I would refer you to is the OBR. They produce some fantastic resources for schools, actually. And one thing is a brief regard, a guide to the public finances, free, you can download it from there. They've got other guides as well. Obviously, we've got... So three types of um, public expenditure. If we're just thinking about public expenditure, you've got current capital transfer payments. These terms, again, precision, absolutely vital. So often students get in a total mess about this and particularly transfer payments. Make sure they understand that they are essentially payments in return for which there is no production. And then I put there some links. And once again, this can help in reinforcing what you previously taught them. So when you're thinking about capital expenditure, they might want to talk about supply side and impact on long run aggregate supply. For example, when they're talking about just the increase in government spending or whatever it is, then there's an injection. Talk about the multiplier and so on. OK. This is something your students, again, you know, can set them as a little five minute exercise, go away and, uh, and find this out. But it's really just making sure they understand that distinction between direct and indirect taxes. And I put the, you know, the, obviously the things here are for them really just to make sure they, they've understood that distinction. Now, more difficult, I think, is teaching this and making sure this is absolutely clear. So when we're thinking about progressive tax, we're talking about the proportion of income. Very important, they get this idea, percentage, proportion of income paid in tax increases as income increases. That's in complete contrast to the regressive tax, where the proportion of income paid in tax decreases as income increases. Some students will say, oh, they pay less tax as they, as they earn more. Of course, that's wrong. And it's this precision again that's really important. And I've, again, if you can give your students, actually, uh, as we did with comparative uh, advantage, a numerical example, then get them to draw the relevant lines on the graph. So what they're saying is, with a progressive tax, the proportion of income you're paying in tax goes up as your taxable income increases. With a proportional tax, it might be a 20% tax on whatever it is. So that's proportional. But obviously, you're paying more as you earn more. With a regressive tax, what's happening is the percentage, notice what we've got on this axis here, the percentage of income you're paying in tax goes down as your income increases. And 
I put here uh, this example from the UK a couple of years ago, roughly, again, worked out by the OBR, I think this was, um, how do indirect taxes as a whole, how they, you know, how do they affect different income groups? And we got this idea of quintiles, the bottom fifth, if you like, of the earnings from 0 to 100. And what you can see is that as incomes increase, these take a smaller proportion of disposable income. That's the critical thing. It doesn't mean these people at the top are paying less regressive uh, indirect taxes. It means that it's a smaller proportion of their income. Really important to get them. Again, this is quantitative skills. And I've just put these questions. This, again, is one of the key skills, quantitative skills. They need to know these sort of things and be able to understand how to use them. Um, and then how much, given that information, how much an increase in indirect taxes affect a country's Gini coefficient? It's likely to increase, of course. So I've put the answers there. But this quintiles thing, like a decile will be a tenth. This The quintile represents 20% of given population. So the first quintile represents the lowest fifth of the data, the 1% to 20% on the lowest incomes, and so on. So that's really, again, to get them to understand data, get their quantitative skills up to date. Um, a real issue has been, say, for example, understanding index numbers. Um, something else needs to be thought about. Right, the other aspect of um, public sector borrowing is this distinction between a fiscal deficit and national debt. And... They will have come across fiscal deficit in theme two, simply where public expenditure growth and tax revenue. The national debt is obviously in this theme, theme four, which is this whole idea of cumulative total of previous government borrowing. Now, again, figures were out, was it earlier this week? We now have a national debt that represents two point, what is it, seven trillion pounds. It's 90, represents 98.3% of GDP. Um, so very significant and th there's quite an issue there uh, about whether that's sustainable and more worrying probably is for um, America, I think. Uh, they're concerned about that. Um, and financial markets, are they going to wear all this high borrowing? Uh, interesting discussion actually the other day I heard was about in half the world's population are going to the polls this year. And somebody who's done some research that suggests that, you know, what tends to happen is that as you head for a general election, um, the purse strings are loose and taxes are cut, more public spending, etc. And so this is an issue for half the world's population, actually, because a lot of governments are doing that to try and curry favour with their electors. Now, another a thing, another couple of terms, really important that they understand precisely the distinction between structural and cyclical. I'll start with the cyclical, which obviously that's associated with recessions or booms. So this is when taxes in a recession, for example, will fall because fewer people are working. They're not spending so much. Government is spending is higher, though, because of welfare payments and they will disappear automatically as the economy grows again, returns to a normal level of economic activity. The structural deficits, however, some people are, argue is much more serious because they would still be around even when the economy is operating at its usual level of rate of economic growth. And that is can be a worry, and that's why some economists would argue we need to uh, do much more about dealing with the structural budget deficit um, in our country. And I've given you just here an example of a question in this area, just so students again can think about this. This was one from June 19. So Japan's budget deficit were, was expected to be 4.6%, but its national debt was forecast to be above 250% of GDP. So What's the impact of that? And it's very interesting, actually, because 
with Japan, it's always been thought, well, it's not such a problem. They can run this. I mean, we're worried about us nearly hitting 100 percent. With J Japanese, it's 250 percent. Why is nobody so concerned? Well, there's an answer to that in that a lot of their debt is held by their own citizens. So it's not subject to such uh, international pressures. But I mean, th this is a sort of area where questions may be asked. And, you know, you need to I mean, obviously, this was in paper three, so the essay would have been related to data. But I mean, this is an area really where um, obviously students need to understand this distinction and they need to understand why it could be a problem, why it may not be a problem to evaluate that. Now, again, when you're teaching your students, uh, as I did this with theme three and gave you some diagrams, here I've just given some phrases because I think again what tends to happen is students can get very shoddy about how they how they answer questions and in their writing and this thing about being precise is so important so progressive tax the more you earn the more you pay well it's partially right but it's not totally right because it's missed out the fact that it's you pay a higher proportion of your income as um in tax as your income increases. And then proportional tax, you pay the same amount of tax, whatever your income. Well, no, it's the same proportion. It might be stuck at 20%, but you'll be paying more tax as your income goes up. Public expenditure, this uh, regrettably is still not uncommon where people say, oh, this is money spent come by consumers. I forget it's about the government. Fiscal deficits, so often, sadly, we see this defined as, you know, value of imports greater than value of exports rather than public expenditure greater than taxation. And similarly, national debt confused there with the fiscal deficit. And automatic stabilizers just in a very loose way saying when government increases welfare payments, not really a full answer. So some of these are partially right, but they're not precise and they will not get marks for that sort of imprecision. So, and certainly, you know, you could get multiple choice questions on these and easy to, to get mistakes if you haven't got a really precise knowledge. So what I wanted to do in this last little bit is to just focus on some exam techniques and from mainly from examiner's reports and so on. So the real thing I think is to think here about the timings for section A, you've got these um, 25 marks, five questions. Essentially, it should be a marker minute here. And really do not really discourage your students from writing too much on these. It will have a huge opportunity cost in terms of the levels-based questions later on. For the data response, it is probably worth spending a bit longer than a mark a minute because they need to read the data. They need to understand the data. They need to highlight the data. They need to be able to see, you know, referring to extract A, what is, you know, they've got to actually have read that data or referring to figure one. They've got to understand the figure and use it in answering their questions. And for the essay, I'm suggesting they're 35 marks, 35 minutes rather. So it's really just getting that idea across, I think. And for paper three, obviously this is in, you know, got two sections. You need to have an hour on each section. But again, I've suggested uh, essentially 25 minutes for data response, let's say 35 minutes in each case. Now, there are a couple of quite chapped things, so I better just look at those. Uh, right, OK, so let me just check. Uh, right, for a 15 marker, how many KS evaluation recommended is one enough? It depends very much on the question. Generally speaking, for 15 markers, they probably want to be exploring more than one issue. But as I've said before, if you can have a mac macro question that says, you know, well, discuss the effect of freezing of tax thresholds. Well, the thing is, they could start off by saying, OK, that means disposable income goes down. That means consumption might go down. That means aggregate demand goes down. That has an impact on 
real output. Do you see what I mean? So there's a long chain of reasoning. They might have supported it with a diagram, and I might be thinking, if I was marking that, well, this is really good, and that's enough. And the evaluation might be, well, of course, that depends on other things staying the same. Uh, people's people's uh, wages might be rising faster than than the chain. The the fact that the thresholds haven't changed. It may it there may be other factors. Um, so I think it does depend on the question. But in some quake cases, you'll see fifty markers that say. Um, you know, discuss the effects of. Well, it's no good just discussing one effect. If it's if um, they've got to go further than one thing, or it may dis it may talk about the external benefits and external costs of something. I've seen questions like that in fifteen markers. Well, you can't just discuss external costs. So it does depend on the question. Um, somebody's asked me about the PowerPoint material, which I think. You, if you haven't, you can access it at the bottom of the screen where it has um, resources. And if not, I believe there is uh, some other way. Maybe Colin can just help us out there. Thank you for the question. Right. Okay. Now, the the other thing is maximizing your students' performance, and I just re-emphasize a few points here. Only limited time should be spent on questions with low marks. There we go. The short answer questions in, a, in, in papers, in section A of papers one, two, five and eight mark questions in all papers are points based. So you really have to remember when you're teaching your students this, if you've got the eight mark question, there are two for, very clearly, two for knowledge, two for application, two for analysis, two for evaluation. Now, there's really not a lot of point in writing a load of knowledge-based stuff if you know you're only going to get two marks. And again, I've seen this in papers before where some people write far too much on the eight mark questions. I mean, it might be you have a knowledge mark and then it's you have some linked explanation of that with a, just a sentence or so, which will only, which will be enough for an analysis mark. The formulae and quantitative skills, you know, by that I mean you've got to know how to calculate the Gini coefficient, say in today's session. You've got to know how to calculate price elasticity of demand. So that's those things really important. And you're not going to get those given to you in the exam. You might do it in chemistry or something, but certainly not in economics. The diagrams, again, they need to be uh, used wherever possible. And they need, even if they're not actually specifically required. And further down, I thought they must be integrated into the written analysis. Application, really want to emphasize this again. You can do beautiful, you know, theoretical analysis, but most of these questions in the data response, it is emphasize your student data response. You must respond to the data and therefore the answers should be related to the context of the question. So often, and you'll see this in the examiner's reports, there are generic answers and they will never get, possibly they won't get more than level two. Well, that's disastrous, you know, and the student might know quite a lot, but they haven't used the context. They haven't applied it in any sense at all. Think about development economics, what I said earlier on, refer to a developing country of your choice self and you see those answers, you know, something about aid and they're just right, all the theoretical stuff and won't relate it to any country whatsoever. This is not good practice. Data response, I'm sorry, paper three, remember it's data response all the way through. So the essays are based on the data as well. Remember, remind your students of that. And then we've got limit, I was just saying here, limited number of points analyzed and evaluated in depth. In other words, another very common error is for students to write seven or eight points, always in separate paragraphs, and there'll be no more, if you're lucky, a two-stage chain of reasoning. Way, well, no more than level two for that. Uh, the diagrams I've talked about use the theory precisely and in context because that is really significant. And um, then 
I just put at, 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 at the end there about the evaluation, I think, um, it's, it's really important. So remember the not to forget about that. So I just wanted to, there's a number of questions, so just go to the chat for a second. Uh, I just want to be able to find out if all sessions materials are available. Again, I, I can't answer that, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, somebody's replied to that. That's fine. Thank you, Colin. Has replied to that. That's all fine. Brilliant. Thank you, Colin. Just wanted to check those were all okay. Right. And so the summary here, I and this really summarizes a lot of what we've done in the course. So nine sessions is precision, and in this case, I've given you the particular examples of that. The measurement should be understand understood about Gini, HDI, and so on. Case studies, talked a lot about that. Um, focusing in terms of the financial sector on the wider economy, and I've showed you how to link that to uh, aspects of all the other themes. Significance of data, um, and really this, this whole idea of, you know, fiscal deficits, national deficits. I put here these things, to get some idea of significance, you need to think about them in relation to GDP. So you might say, oh, you know, we've got a national debt of two point something trillion pounds. Well, how significant that is depends on the size of GDP, essentially. And to summarize, then I put good exam technique can, can have a significant impact on overall performance like timing, context rather than generic responsible, being mindful of whether the question is points-based or level, levels-based and evaluating using context and change the reasoning. So it's not just in the analysis, but also in the evaluation that students need to use their context and also to just not just write, oh, it depends on the magnitude of the change or it depends short run, long run. That's not good enough. You've got to develop a chain of reasoning and relate it to the context. OK, so I've just put here, if, if there were to be more sessions in next academic year, uh, maybe you want to write something in the chat box. And if there are any other questions or issues, I know I've rushed through this today, but I want to get through quite a few things today. And so I hope you've got something out of it and thank you for listening. And if, as I say, you want some other areas or specific, more specific areas covered in any future sessions, perhaps you could write in the chat box and if Pearson decide to run them, then those can be considered. Answer writing? Yeah. I'm not sure I'm allowed to give my email contact. I think the person to contact is Colin Leith, who you will have his contact address. Absolute poverty. It is a minefield, I have to say. Absolute minefield. Uh, and and I think, um, as I say, your your examiners, um, I the, the the examiners will know that they have to accept the definition as in the getting started guide, although it is now been superseded. But um, yeah, I, I think. Um, that is something that we would we we would uh, that needs to be updated along with many other things in the spec. Specific paper feedback. Somebody has asked. Yes. Okay. Well, we used to do that. I don't know whether that's still being done, but um, I'm sure that's something that Colin will note down. <laughs> Oh, 
one doesn't say anything else. Detailed chains of reasoning somebody's put down as well. How do we do that? But I think some specific examples of those things would be helpful. Yeah. Thing, just please do so, otherwise we'll finish in a minute. We'll give one more minute. But thank you also for your comments. It's very helpful. <laughs>